Right. So, yes, so I can introduce the two presenters. Today, the title of the presentation is Distributional Analysis of Water Use Among Urban Households in the Multi Country Study. And the authors are Prof. Martin Visa, who specializes in behavioral economics application uh, to climate change issues. Um, she's currently at the School of Economics, University of Cape Town, and the director for the EAV Center in Cape Town. And Prof. Joseph Cook is an associate professor in the School of Economics Science at Washington State University. And he focuses on water sanitation policy in low income countries and on water resource economics, non market valuation, and green stormwater and infrastructure. Right. So um, I don't know the time uh, allocation between the two of you, how you want to do it, but we'll first listen to the presentation. And if you have your comments, suggestions, you, you write it down. And then after the presentation, you can ask your questions. Right, Martin, you have the floor. Thanks a lot, Amin. I'm just um, trying to get back to this presenter view. If it doesn't work, I'll ask Joe to do it, who is a lot more tech savvy than me. Um, just give me a sec. I did, did see it just now on my, yeah, there you go. It should, it should go now. There we go. Have you got it? Yes, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So as um, Amin said, this is a joint work um, um, between myself and Joe, but there's also other co-authors involved. And in fact, this is in some sense three different papers that we're presenting in one. It's a sort of a body of research that's emanated out of work that uh, Joe and I and, and Joanna Brill worked on some years ago during the Cape Town drought. And subsequently, um, the water systems group that is part of NATCAP and who is bit, that's being led by Roger Madrigal from Costa Rica, from CATI. Um, we've kind of been quite active with NFD and met regularly. And so we've started various research projects under the water systems group. And one of them has been a continuation of this work looking at distributional statistics of municipal water use. So um, this all started, uh, yeah, as I said, back in the time um, we, we had the Cape Town drought. Um, I had started working with the Cape Town's utilities data some time ago and had access to that data, which was very helpful when Cape Town entered the drought because we could sort of track what was happening with regards to consumption, but also with regards to regulations as it was being phased in. And so based on that, um, Joe approached me to um, maybe c continue with the work and start looking in more depth at some of the, the distributional statistics um, that was coming out of it. I'll show you a slide which I think piqued his interest in initially because we were able to see how looking at different income quintiles um, the the use of water completely converged during that time of drought between different income groups and so that seemed really interesting and we wanted to understand um, in more depth what the implications were for affordability conservation and potential tariff design going forward in situations like that. And so with a special interest in cities where there is inequality. So just a bit of background on this then is that um, Cape Town started experiencing unprecedented um, drought in the sort of just post, post 2015, beginning of 2016 period. And that drought escalated um, beyond anybody's expectations. It was the worst drought in a hundred years over a period of three years from 2016 to 2018. And during that time, as I said, the, the municipality implemented all different kinds of uh, traditional regulatory instruments, as well as non-traditional scare tactics and um, campaigns, etc. So it's really interesting to look at how people responded to um, that drought and to the measures that was phased in, but also how that differed between different income groups. Um, I think the whole world started to take notice at the point where 
we uh, approached a period where peop, uh, the city threatened that we might get to a day zero, a day where household taps would run dry. And if you look at these two pictures below, um, the top one shows you um, the, the main dam that supplies the city of Cape Town during normal times. And then below you see what that dam looked like during the time when um, the drought was at its peak. And I mean, water had completely dried up. <clears throat> Just understanding a little bit more in terms of the background of Cape Town's water access and water use, um, on, on the whole, 69% of people or house, households or water is used by the residential sector. So we decided to make that the focus of our initial study, especially also because of the level of inequality between um, households within the city. Um, one of the other things is that we often ask why we didn't work with informal households. Well, it's important to understand that 88% of households in the city have direct access to water um, and the, the households that receive, uh, receives bills um, are um, freestanding domestic households. So we, we chose to work with those because we could actually um, monitor the, 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 the use of data over time and also look at the impact of regulation during that time by um, by focusing on that household. But something else to sort of keep in mind is that the informal households in Cape Town, while a large part of the population, only use like 4% of the city's um, water. So again, a reason why we decided to focus on these domestic freestanding households. Another um, aspect to understand about the city is that we rely on an increasing block tariff structure and specifically the first block has been free, that first six kiloliters has been free for many years until July 2017 where, where we were already quite deep into the drought. Um, at, at which point we, we moved on to level three, and I'll show you the, the tariffs just now. But then um, at the time, the, 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 the pricing of water sort of keep, kept going up until February 2018, where we were really at that point where we thought we were going to hit day zero. And then the city is really escalated the, the prices, and that was when we hit level 6B in February 2018. Then when the rain came and around March, April, and then by about um, October 2018, sorry, did I say, we had the, the city then reduced tariffs after the drought to back to level five. And then there was a further reduction in prices in December 2018. And since November 2020, water restrictions haven't changed at all. So here it is. I just wanted to highlight those key moments. But if you look at the tariff blocks um, in, the, in the top area, you see in level one and level two um, was during January um, 2015 and 2016. And then as we came into December 2016, we went, we, we were still in level three. And there you can see that for tariff block one, people were still paying nothing. And this was everybody from the poorest to the richest households. And then in July 2017, we move on to level 4B and that's where people started, uh, the um, average households started paying for water but the indigent households were still paying um, nothing for their water. And I'll talk more about the indigents um, subsequently. Um, level 6B, which was uh, February 2018, was a period that I just referred to where we sort of hit the peak of the drought. And there you can see that, for instance, in that first tariff block, the price for water goes up dramatically from 4 Rand to 26 Rand 25 cents per kiloliter. Um, and then after, I mean, it's even more dramatic if you look for at the tariff block six for the highest income or the highest consuming group, they went from two, two, 265 rands per kiloliter to a thousand rands per kiloliter at that point. 
And then after the drought in October 2018, you see that drop in prices and then it, uh, the prices were even reduced more um, going on to December 2018. And here's just an overview that was constructed of the dam levels during that period if you start in January 2014. And you see that cyclical pattern, which is um, in the in the summer times, um, in the winter times, there's more water in the dams and then it draws down in the summer time when people are using more water and there's less rain. And then you see how low the dam levels dropped during the drought in that period between 2016 and 2018 and how it starts to increase again um, as you go towards uh, 2021. And the, and the levels, the water restriction levels are seen in the background there. Um, uh, at its peak level six at the height, height of the drought around February 2018. So based on this work, we've actually um, completed several papers. Um, one study was by myself and Johanna Brühl, where we sort of try to track the pattern of water use. You'll see that graph on the left and all the regulations, the little lines on on that graph shows you where where each new water restriction level uh, was phased in and also where the city made announcements about um, de declaring the Western Cape as a disaster area, also the point when they uh, uh, released the disaster plan and when they announced day zero, etc. Um, on the right hand side, you can see a breakdown where we've kind of um, broken it up in terms of income deciles with the highest income to the decile being there at the top. You can see that households in the first income decile, uh, the poorer households are less able to adjust the consumption because they are already at quite a low level. Whereas for high income households is that kind of cyclical pattern where people consume a lot of water during the summer. These households often have um, gardens and swimming pools, etc. And then in the winter, they use less water. But then note that as we go into that drought period, and especially during 2017, 2018, how the consumption of households converged to the point that high income households actually started consuming less than low income households. Um, and we actually um, published a paper in water resources research, um, Joe, uh, Joe, Johanna and myself, based on the um, distributional stats work that we did for that period. And what I'll be showing you today is a mix of that and then also the subsequent analysis of what we see um, emerging post the drought. Just a little bit more about the background here and one needs to understand something about Cape Town's indigent policy. Um, about a third of the households in Cape Town are indigent and those are households who earn below a certain threshold or they live in a property that is um, the value of the property is below a certain threshold value. So if you, the city knows the property values of households, although sometimes it's quite um, old, these values, but they, if, if households fall below that threshold, they in, um, um, immediately are designated as indigent. If they don't, you can also ind independently apply to be uh, qualified for indigent um, billing based on proof of your salary. If you are um, designated as indigent, it means that you get free litre to the point of 10.5 kiloliters. Beyond that, you do start paying and you also get 7.35 kiloliters free for sanitation. In terms of refuse removal and rebates, you get rebates between 25 to 100% based on your property value. You get free basic electricity between 25 and 60 kilowatt hours, and you get a property rebate, a property rate rebate up to 100%. So this is really important and really in terms of the whole story for for affordability that Joe will talk um, to you about a bit later. But it's also still important to keep in mind that often in these indigent households, you have much larger um, household sizes. 
And this will also emerge when we look at these Gini coefficients because it all it makes a big difference whether you look at it at a per capita level or at a household level. Um, and if you look at it uh, at a per capita level, per capita level, the inequality is, worsens. So, just a bit more about the Gini coefficient. Most of you uh, are aware about how it's used in economics to look at differences in wealth dis distributions within populations. Um, typically, use looking at measures of income and wealth inequality where perfect equality is when the Gini coefficient is equal to zero and perfect inequality is when the Gini coefficient is equal to one. Um, in the water sector, distributional statistics has been used less often. Often when it, ha where it has been used, it's been for um, inequality with regards to water access and water supply, whereas we tend to focus on uh, water consumption in this study. So um, the studies like Yang et al, Bertha, uh, Guragai, and also Hu et al has looked at um, a distributional stats, but as I said, in more in the water access and water supply areas. So in terms of the analysis, the initial anal analysis, which has already been published in um, the journal that I indicated earlier, use monthly water data from the utilities data for city of Cape Town between the periods of June 2014 to May 2018, so just at the sort of the end of the drought period, um, for re residential households. Um, the sample is about 500,000 households, so we're working with really big data here. Um, and then what we've done is we've subsequently updated the analysis um, with data of, of the post drought period. This data is running from January 2018 to December 2022. <clears throat> we'll probably update it some more um, um, in, in our subsequent analysis now before we um, send the paper for, for publication or, for, or submit it to, to a journal. Um, what was uh, dropped from the data set was households where there was likely to be leaks. So we did try and sort of clean the data set some, somewhat. Um, and then the Gini coefficient is calculated in the conventional manner, um, looking at that expression where W there is um, the household's I water use in month I, and N is the total households, which is then ordered from lowest to highest water use. Um, what was really uh, unique or advantageous in terms of the data that we had available is that we had access to the census data and we could use um, unique identifiers in the billing data to overlay the census data with the billing data. And although it's a slightly sort of older version of the census from 2011, it's been very useful in enriching the data by um, accessing household income and household size as well. And that's why I said that when you look, think about this from a distributional perspective, it's really important also to have access to the household size because often that sort of skews the picture in terms of looking at water use and also has huge implications for how much the household ends up paying, especially if it's an indigent household once it goes over and above the, the, the free water use uh, point of 10.5 kiloliters where they suddenly then enter much higher tariff blocks. <clears throat> so looking at this graph, this is the Gini coefficient um, and you can see that the brownish line is the Gini per capita and the greenish line is the uh, Gini at the household level. So the, the household level Gini is slightly lower, as I said, so it's le less unequal. And when you look at it at the per capita level, it's, it's, it's the, the, the coefficient increases. In that initial period, as you can see that there is the, the Gini is quite high and it reaches um, over 0.4 um, for the at the per capita level. But you also do see that cyclical pattern where during the summer periods when the high income households are using more water, the inequality increases. And then interestingly, as you move more and more into the drought, the level of inequality converged and the, the level, the Gini uh, estimate drops uh, closer to 0.34. Um, and at some point, the, the household and the per capita levels converge. 
Now, as I move on to this next slide, um, it doesn't look exactly the same, and we uh, ideally will merge this data and put it on, on one slide. But what we work dealing with here is a slightly different data set. The city started releasing their data in a different format. So it also took us a little while to get up to speed with this um, new way of, in which they organize the data. Um, and you can see in that first period between 2018 and 2019, there is a big glitch there in the data which the city has warned us about and said that we shouldn't use that data. There was a big problem with, um, with metering and using estimates at the time and they've more or less, um, <clears throat> they are ignoring that part of the data themselves. So, but for the subsequent period from 2019 on to 2022, you can see how the genie is increasing again. Um, the two, the per capita and household um, uh, genies are sort of in parallel again with the per capita um, estimate being higher, but how in this is a sort of a linear increase back to the original levels. And if I just go back to the original slide, you can see at the peak there in January 2014-15 there, we were actually lower than where we are post 2022. Um, so inequality ends up being slightly higher um, in that post drought period. Here is another graph where we look at the correlation between income and water use. And again, what you can see is in this earlier periods pre drought, there has there's a cyclical pattern where there's a very high correlation with income in the in the summer periods where you know people's irrigating their gardens um, they have their swimming pools etc and then in the winter the correlation with income drops but what we see is as we're going into the drought that correlation with income changes radically to the point that the correlation coefficient drops to below zero and becomes negative where high income households consumption drops so much that, the, that it actually overtakes or undertakes the low income households because they're using less water. And I mean, in our previous papers, we tried to unpack that and understand that as well. But um, I think this in itself has Im implications for, um, for um, the bills that households received the affordability at that time for households depending on whether they were indigent or not and Joe's going to talk more about that. You'll see here that in that post drought period again I'm going to ignore that little piece between 2018 and 19 um, because of the glitch in the data but from January 19 onwards you can see how the correlation goes back up to where it was before and then um, from 2020 onwards you start seeing that cyclical pattern with regards to income and water use again. So right now we're probably back or even higher than where we were before. Um, and so this it's a it's a really interesting picture that emerged with regards to how the uh, water use distribution changed through this period of crisis. Um, and here you see a, a graph where we've split it up into five different income quintiles. Um, the first line here at the bottom shows you where the six kiloliter limit is, where most households pay, um, paid zero before the, before the drought. And then you can see the 10.5 kiloliter level is where um, the level um, at which indigents um, receive free water. <clears throat> and there you can very clearly and distinctly see how the fifth income quintile, the wealthiest households, had that cyclical pattern in terms of water use also prior to the drought, and how that level of use drops in July 2017, or just before that, it drops to below what the, um, the consumption is for the lowest quintile, which is the blue, blue and the orange lines are that those lower quintiles. Um, and then subsequently, this whole picture changes again and we go back to where we've been. Here we go, you can see that post 2018, although between 2019-20, there's still a period in which um, there was a, a, 
an inertia where the consumption between households remained quite similar. It took a, t a little bit of time before the high income quintile started increasing their consumption again. And that is, is interesting in itself to understand. <clears throat> I've worked with um, other co-authors, Kelsey Jack um, and Cassandra Cole and others, where we try to see to what extent um, the, the reason why high income households didn't increase their consumption immediately was because there had been sort of systematic changes in people's water use and sort of people households also moving off grid some households um, having um, attained water um, boreholes and wells during that period of time but i think there was also a large behavioral component component of people having been through this immense crisis and having really changed their attitudes um, about water use and so the inf informational campaigns and the, 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 the severe trauma that people face during this time with regards to the threat of running out of water um, actually influenced their water use for a period, a substantial period, before they started um, increasing their water use again. So Joe is going to take over from this point and talk more about some of the um, issues around uh, the, the affordability of water and so on, and then uh, about our subsequent work with, with um, several of the other countries in the water systems group. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Martine. Um, so yes, just picking up here, um, let's now sort of move to thinking about what are the implications for this for both how utilities think about designing tariffs, but also about uh, affordability. So um, one thing to think about just picking up this story a little bit is who, who are these top 10%? Um, Martin has been talking about this correlation with income, but an interesting thing to, to note is that because those correlations went into reverse, that group, that top 10% of water users um, became a, a, a group that was uh, on average poor. So you can see here that they, um, the average income dropped uh, from 26,000 Rand to, <clears throat> to 17,000 Rand. So we have a changing composition of those top 10%. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important in part because whenever utilities are using increasing block tariffs and they have water distributions uh, or energy distributions that are skewed um, and right-tailed, the utilities are quite dependent financially on the bills from those top 10% of users. So that's what the second bullet point is showing you. Um, in this initial period, the utility was uh, was getting 54 to almost 70% of their total tariff revenues from that top 10% of users. And the bottom 50% of users were only contributing five to 10%. So when you see changes in water use among that top 10%, it implies very large changes to, to the financial status of the utility. That money needs to um, come from somewhere else. It needs to come from um, maybe non-volumetric components of the tariffs. Um, and so going back to that upper bullet point, that implies that um, although the utility was still getting most of its revenue from the top 10%, it would be a mistake to think that those were the wealthiest households and that this was in fact a, a progressive way to, for a utility to raise revenue. Um, next slide, please. <coughs> so building on that, um, as you know, most of the SDGs um, contain the word affordable, uh, affordable access to energy, affordable access to healthcare, affordable access to water, and so we wanted to also look at what is the a picture of afford bill affordability in Cape Town. Now, there's no set definition in different sectors, including the water sector, on what is an affordable bill. Um, some common thresholds are 3% of income. If you spend more than that, it's unaffordable. More common are 5% and 10%. So if you spend above 10% on your combined water and sanitation bill, we might say that that bill is unaffordable. So this is showing you affordability, the percentage of people who are spending above 5% of their income on these water bills, that's the blue line, or above 10%. And you can see that overall, the, the, the radical increase in prices that Martine uh, outlined 
actually didn't lead to a, a large increase in affordability problems, in part because people's water use was declining. And of course, we're economists, so we would sort of think that makes sense. The tariff, tariffs went up, people reduced their water use. Um, another thing that's not really in this picture is um, how did the indigent program, the program to protect people who are low income from price shocks and high water bills, how did that affect affordability? In another graph that we, we uh, have in the paper, we show what the program would have looked like, what affordability would have looked like had South Africa not had or Cape Town not had that indigent program. And it's much, much worse. So those indigent households would have been spending 30% of their income on a combined water bill. Um, so clearly not, they don't have the ability to reduce their water enough to overcome these really, really rapidly increasing prices. And so in that sense, this indigent program, this customer assistance program was really helpful. So what does the picture look like um, post 2018? Martine, next slide, please. So as she was noting, we want to be careful about um, thinking of this uh, period between July 2018 and, and January 2019. You can see that, again, those, the tariffs were still quite high in January of 2018, but came down. And so affordability now is back to roughly the same place that it was before the drought. The percentage of people who are spending above 5% of their income is hovering between 5 and 10% of, of households. Next slide, please. Um, actually, one thing I wanted to mention on the last slide, but we can stay here, is the other thing just to keep in your brain as we're talking about percentage of income is that uh, inflation might really matter here, right? Because um, this is income data static back to 2011. Um, the tariffs uh, are not adjusted for inflation that Martine showed you, but that also means that um, inflation is eroding the real price of water. So we're uh, we're actually, you know, in, in some sense, probably water is getting more affordable over time because in, in all likelihood, people's incomes are increasing. Um, and so the bills are not increasing as, as rapidly probably as incomes in the way that we're structuring our data, just to keep that in mind. Here's the affordability picture across these income quintiles. So as you can see, the fifth quintile, the wealthiest, uh, overall people are spending a very, very small fraction of their, uh, of their income on water. But even among this lowest quintile that should be a qualifying for the, the indigent program, it does spike in the very end when prices went up really dramatically to about 20%. Again, this this includes the indigent program, it would have been much worse without it. And uh, let's look at what the picture is post 2018. Um, it comes radically back down. So again, that could be, um, there could be something real in there and that blue line being very, very high when prices are very high. But again, the data is a bit suspect uh, in this time period. There's no question that there probably were some households who were, who were really struggling to pay their water bills when prices were so high. Uh, and as I'll say at the at the close, sort of understanding what's happening there is an important um, uh, uh, policy story. But again, the, the the sorry, the basic story with the rest of that graph is that from 2019 on, the tariffs came back down, and uh, and the water use pattern basically went very similarly back to where it was before the drought. And affordability is generally not a major concern. Next slide, please. So just conclusions on the Cape Town work before um, I'll talk briefly about some of the newer stuff in other cities. So we use the Gini coefficient to compare water use inequality over time uh, in the presence of these shocks, this the droughts, all kinds of policies, major tariff changes. Um, and you see that the distribution became more equal. Um, we saw this interesting pattern of the correlation between income and water going into reverse during the drought, but basically coming back after the drought to, to very similar uh, levels to where it was before. I guess uh, on this bullet point, I would also point out to those of you interested in energy, I think that these kinds of calculations could also be done on energy use. There's a new NBER working paper by Severin Borenstein on energy in the US, and he, he talks that that team talks about energy hogs uh, and you know who are the people who are using a lot of energy. 
I think there's also potential in this network to think about both of these things at the same time. Households are consuming both of these things, energy and water, and how are they interrelated? Um, so the second bullet point here, um, we also wanted to look at whether these um, the Gini coefficient was tracking changes in, in water use among higher high users. And so we saw these large reductions by high income, high water users, but we also saw this demographic reshuffling of the top water users. So we, we saw that the average income of the top 10% um, uh, uh, um, dropped. And also one thing I forgot to mention on the previous slides is you might say, how is it possible for the bottom quintile, the, the poorest households who are qualifying for this indigent program, how is it that they could be spending 20% of their income? Well, remember the indigent program only provides 10 and a half kiloliters per month. And I think what Martine um, didn't mention is that what happens if you use more than 10 and a half kiloliters is that you get kicked into the tariff structure at the next block, at the third uh, tier. And that third tier is one of the tiers that jumped pretty substantially because the utility was trying to use that price in that tier to say, get, get your consumption below 10 and a half kiloliters. So if you were a poor household who had a relatively large household, you, uh, a, a household size, you might actually have trouble getting your water use below 10 and a half kiloliters and the tariffs would still affect you. Or you could be a middle income household. Um, and so understanding why it is that um, poor and middle income households had trouble reducing their water use under 10 and a half kiloliters um, is an important story. Uh, is it household size? Was it harder for those households to make capital investments in water conservation um, equipment? Um, or was there something else happening that led them to um, struggle to take advantage of the, of the program? So with that, let's um, shift now for just, I'll spend a few minutes. We thought it would be interesting um, thank you. Uh, to, to talk briefly about uh, another application of this basic approach, and here this is uh, funded by an EFT grant that um, Martine mentioned at the beginning. Roger is the PI. It's a, we, we sort of informally call it the Global Urban Water Observatories Project, where we're trying to take advantage of the fact that we have these amazing colleagues uh, all over the world who have built relationships very difficult to build relationships um, with uh, water utilities and where we have access to individual level water billing data. And so one thing that we're trying to do is say, well, what if we calculated these distributional statistics in different utilities in different countries? Uh, next slide, please. So we'll just give you a picture um, of this. Mauricio, I should have said on the last slide, Mauricio, uh, uh, in, in EFE Chile is really leading this, uh, the, the draft paper that we have so far, but this, these are very much draft results, but we thought it would be interesting to show you these. So the sites here are, um, uh, sorry, Martine, I put this on these, one of these where you have to click to make them re um, uh, review. So you can go ahead and, and click the next couple. So uh, Kampala, Nairobi, San Jose, and, and Santiago. Um, you'll notice that these are different time periods. We don't have access to the exact same time period in each place. Uh, and so when, when I show you the graphs here in a second, they're going to be indexed to sort of a time zero, but just realize that those time zeros are different times uh, are different times in different cities. And of course, there's different things happening in each of these cities over those times. They, there could have been um, you know, droughts or economic uh, crises in these places that are affecting this. We don't think there actually is, but that's a, a problem with, you know, sort of mixing these time periods. And again, this is a relatively uh, large data set. We're talking about, um, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of accounts, and then millions of records. So Martine talked about the methods, very similar here. We're not going to think about commercial customers uh, uh, or industrial customers. We're going to focus only on household accounts that uh, the utility uh, uh, characterized as residential household accounts. And a big weakness so far is that we're having trouble finding demographic characteristics to match. Now, this is a common problem. Water utilities don't observe the demographic characteristics of their customers, just like uh, electricity providers don't as well. And as Martine mentioned, in Cape Town, what we were able to do is to match it at the small at small area layer of the, of the South African census. So we 
assign the demographic characteristics of, uh, of a geographic region to the household, but we, we never actually observe the demographics for that household. Here, we're even having trouble getting small enough uh, census level data and matching that. And I'll come back to that at the very end. Just like in Cape Town, we dropped uh, observations that we assumed were leaks. So here's the, the distribution of water use. This is just a probability density function of each of the four. And just to sort of make the simple point here that um, these water use distributions usually have this big right tail. And you see this in almost any water utility you would ever look at. It was really the sort of motivating idea behind all this work is how do we characterize that right tail and how important is that right tail? Um, next slide, please. Here is the graph of the Gini coefficients for these four new cities. I'm showing you on the left the, the range that Martine was just talking about for Cape Town, roughly 0.36 to 0.47. So you can see in, across these cities, uh, we see the highest water use inequality in Nairobi in blue, Kampala in red, um, Santiago, Chile, and then the lowest is San Jose in, in Costa Rica. And Cape Town would actually be in the lower between Santiago and, and, and San Jose. Another thing to point out about this is we don't see, like the graphs that Martin showed you, we don't see big seasonal patterns in inequality. You don't see um, uh, some a regular uh, pattern. So that would sort of indicate that in these places, outdoor water use is, is less likely to be um, happening than it was in Cape Town. Next slide, please. This is, uh, we. Martin didn't present this for the Cape Town work, but this is another simple way of thinking about water use uh, distributional statistics, just like you would see in income or wealth. You might present the Gini coefficient, but you'd also say what percent of income is earned by the top 10% of income uh, of, of earners. And so panel A here is showing you what percentage of all the water delivered to residential water customers is going to the top 10% of water users. So you can see it's almost half in Nairobi of all the water supplied to households goes to the top 10% of water users. 16% goes to the top 1% of water users. So this is why the Nairobi distribution looks to be the most unequal so far. Um, and in Kampala, top 10%, about 38% of water goes to the top 10%, um, et cetera. Now, panel B is showing you uh, what is, in fact, the water use, uh, the mean and the median uh, for those households. And so this is a little bit of a red flag to me. Um, in that Nairobi, the top 10% of water users are using 124 cubic meters per month. And that's quite a lot of water. So there is a little bit of a concern that could there could be a misclassification, that there could be some commercial customers that are misclassified in the billing data as households which could be driving some of these um, statistics. Next slide, please. Almost done, I want to make sure we have time for some questions. So again, when you have these unequal distributions and you have increasing block tariffs, which all four of these cities have, the utility is financially dependent on the water use and the bills from those top 10%. So again, in Nairobi, half of the revenue for that group comes from the top 10%. That's pretty, um, pretty striking. So if water use changed, if those households switched to private supply or wells, um, if they uh, cut back their water use substantially, the utility would run a pretty big financial hole. Next slide, please. So um, again, as I mentioned, some, some caveats here is we don't have any information yet on income or wealth or household size. So we can't distinguish between per, per household and per capita water use. Um, one idea is uh, there's a team at Berkeley that's been working with Meta to come up with this uh, a relative wealth index all around the world. It's a pretty interesting project. They're using you know the kind of data that uh, Meta Facebook has access to to estimate what they think are households um, relative wealth. So we won't have household size, but we're in the process of trying to match that data to at least look at um, uh, wealth. Next, yeah. Um, we don't talk at all about customer assistance programs. So far, there is a program, a famous program in Chile that we will um, we will try to incorporate and, and think a little bit more carefully about, but there aren't customer assistance programs or indigent programs, as Martin called it, in South Africa. 
uh, in, in Costa Rica, Kenya, or Uganda. Um, and then another issue here in Kampala and Nairobi is um, there's a, a, a larger share of customers who aren't connected. So another reason that Nairobi might have higher water use inequality is in fact households are sharing water or even selling water from their own private connections, which is pushing them to use very high amounts of water, but the, their own household is not using, for example, 124 cubic meters. They, they're in fact sharing it with their neighbors who don't have um, connections. And as I mentioned, there's a potential here uh, for misclassifying uh, customer classes. And we also are hoping um, there's, you know, some irons in the fire where other colleagues have have built relationships or are building relationships with the utilities. So we're hoping we may um, be able to add a few other cities before we wrap this paper up and send it out for review. So we'll leave it there. Um, thanks so much uh, for for your attention, and we're happy to take uh, questions. Um, thank you. Thank you, Martin and Joe. That's a wonderful presentation. So uh, I promised Amin uh, to take care of the uh, Q&A section because he has to go for uh, teaching. So um, I have already noticed uh, two questions by Guna and Alejandro. So uh, Guna, do you want to uh, uh, raise the question yourself? Because, yeah, for communication, maybe it's better. Mm -hmm. And then Alejandro. Okay, then Jonas. Yeah, uh, thank you. Wow. Um, it's so it's so exciting, Martin, also to see the, the follow up on, on the data. As, as you know, I was there for the day zero period and I, I saw everything that was going on, all these people drilling and and, you know, investing in all these tanks and so on. So so and, and you mentioned it, but but did you have any handle on what was actually going on and and uh, can you see that from individual statistics how they have substituted to private sources uh, and so on well so in that sense we i mean we did do some surveys subsequently to to try and assess uh, which household how households responded with, with regards to gray water systems um uh, uh, water tanks and also wells and boreholes um, but in, in, independent from that, we um, obtain information around um, the, the amount of drilling that has taken place. Obviously, at that time, the city required households to license or register their, their boreholes, and many households didn't. So the, we suspect that the numbers are higher than, than what we have access to, but the city does have a database. And then on top of that, um, in this other paper that I mentioned, we use some um, sort of um, satellite cl climate information to look at the, the water level in vegetation in the areas. And we also look at um, uh, water levels at, at depth uh, that's been monitored in deep boreholes um, to see what the impact was of water extraction during that period. So it's sort of a combination of that story. Thank you. Uh, Alejandro? Uh, yes, if he's not... Oh, okay, he's here. Yep. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks. Very, very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, uh, Martin and, and Joe, great. Uh, so I, I have a couple of questions. I mean, one is related to uh, this thing that, that Martin was talking about, the, the correlation no, with income, how it changes, and then it becomes negative. And, and also, I, I could see some of the how the, the highest quintile kind of behaves in a, in a very interesting way and it actually goes down even you know, f below the other quintiles in terms of consumption. So do, it, does that have to do anything with uh, the richer households being more able to, to adopt some water saving technologies or something like that that allows them to actually consume less uh, uh, water uh, when, when it's very expensive to do it? And, and then the other one is related to the work that you're doing now with the water observatories. I mean, I was wondering if beyond this characterization that you do of water inequality, which is of course very interesting, uh, if there are some specific policies that happen during the time or some event or something that you can look at uh, at, at some of the countries to to, you know, to to see if there is a little bit more some story that can explain what's happening with the with the water use during the time. But uh, this is this is very great work, and I I hope you are able to get more data from different countries from the network as well. 
So I'll re respond to your first question in terms of to what extent we could see what caused that dramatic drop from the high income households. I think one of the big things that drive is um, that they have access to a lot of more technology and access to information through things like the internet. And so there was a lot of information, um, to, especially when the international sort of spotlight was on South Africa as well that uh, made the households much more aware. There was um, cam there was uh, infographics and videos about methods that you could use to re reduce your water use, etc. New technologies that you could use. But um, being here at the time, and Gunnar can attest to that, is that, I mean, it became almost like a social norm and, and, and a, 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 a way of being better than your neighbors in terms of um, telling everybody about what you could do to reduce water. And most people were catching the water from their showers, etc., and using that to flush um, their toilets. So um, I think there was a huge behavioral shift during that time. But that said, from our survey data, we did see that middle and high income households also um, made significant investments, such as um, buying water tanks and a smaller um, percentage of them drilling boreholes, because at the time there was long waiting lists anyway to get uh, even even with the water tanks, people had ordered them but couldn't get them in time. So um, the 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 major investments maybe sort of caused a bit of a lag afterwards in terms of uh, before it started showing up in the data. Um, but interestingly, we've had this this major load shedding in South Africa in the last two years as well. And there we have seen now that a lot of households have kind of invested in their own private resources. Um, by installing solar, for instance. So I think there is that tendency, but uh, but during the drought, there was also this massive um, coming together of of people in in terms of the social dilemma situation. And 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 truly, as you mentioned, for high for the lower income households, there, there's less flexibility there and less access to resources to to take on some of that modifications. Joe, I'll leave the the multi country study to you. The, yeah, the question. Sure. Yeah, thanks for the suggestion, Alejandro. I mean, I think for this paper, we're trying to keep it sort of simple. I mean, I think that paper will not probably talk much about Cape Town, in part because it becomes a very complicated story when you start talking about what has happened in each city, because it's complex. Every location is different. And so I think we're going to try to keep this simple and try to think about what are the implications overall in general for, for tariff design and, and to think about a little bit, if we if we can match to some um, socioeconomic characteristics, this overall correlation between income or wealth and water use that people think they know what it is, but actually it's uh, it's not as, as simple as a lot of people understand. Um, but we certainly, I think the idea is to encourage the network to be well placed to take advantage of things as they arise, um, just like Martine was very well placed in Cape Town to be of so much help to the water utility and to the city. You know, I think the hope is that, you know, these relationships with the utility could could be quite useful um, as these kinds of drought and day zero situations um, continue to happen. Yes, thanks, Joe. Uh, Jonas, please go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. It was great, <clears throat> fascinating work both. Um, I. Um, I wanted to um, comment on two quick things that are common in energy issues of what power supply. In electricity supply in many developing countries, power stealing is a big problem uh, and also distribution and loss. So I was trying to sit in that frame and uh, check if you guys, especially in the multi-country data, you have any information about um, water waste stage like stealing or um, West stage due to you know poor infrastructure. I would expect that this is the problem is going to be likely in poorer neighborhoods uh, because, for example, maintenance is very low, reporting is very low than high income areas. So then that will probably exacerbate the issue of distribution, and you will account that you will think that I mean those low income area areas consumed uh, more water. So I just wanted to hear your insight on that. If there's any way to check for this, yeah, I, I can take that, Martin. Um... Uh, in, in it, that's a great point. It's certainly something you know that that we're thinking more carefully about. In a nutshell, we're not 
we're not basically modeling any losses because structurally the way we do it is we have the billing data set. Yeah. And so we see how much water was billed to customers. Yeah. And that's the sum total. That's the universe is. So we we know that in a sense, if you think about unaccounted service losses, yeah. delivered in the numerator, uh, delivered to customers is in the numerator, delivered at the network level is in the denominator. We don't know anything about the denominator. We could get that from utilities. I mean, most of them have to report unaccounted for water or service losses yeah. like that. But it would incorporate then just the total bulk amount of water that's supplied, which then adds this new complication of, well, we we, we can't now ignore commercial uh, and industrial customers because they're also in the numerator. Uh, and, and again, we think it's probably overly complex to start pulling in these other sectors as well that have just structurally different water use. But it's a great, it's certainly a great point. And certainly other projects in this uh, water kind of universe are thinking about service quality uh, as well, hours of service, which are, are related to those kinds of service losses. Yeah, all right. Thank you. I think time is up. So a uh, big applaud for Martin and Joe. And thank you very much for all the participants. Thank you. See you uh, next time. Bye. Thank you, everyone, Bye, everyone. for joining. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye.